Hey guys, it's Landon Blake from Refine Horizons, and this is a talk we're doing about technology and how it's changed uh, the way surveyors uh, enter the profession and, and learn what it is to be a land surveyor and what the implications are for the future, you know, what technology is going to do to our business models in the future. We'll talk a little bit about uh, what what markets you might be looking at as you as you move 10 or 5 or 10 or 15 years into the future. And uh, so I, I look forward to, to talking with you guys about this uh, about this topic. So uh, this this actually isn't my talk. <laughs> it's actually it was supposed to be given by Mr. Michael Palomari, and uh, he had something come up. He wasn't able to to give the talk, so I got asked to pinch hit. So you guys kind of you you bought a Mercedes and you got a moped. So I apologize. let me apologize for that up front. But uh, Mr. Mr. Palomari has been in business a lot longer than I have. So I've only owned my own business for about a year, but I've been surveying for about 20 years and I've definitely learned a lot the last 12 months um, about running a business. I will also tell you that um, I take pride in being a, a student of business and um, I, I have a, a passionate interest in what it is that makes organizations effective and how they add value. So uh, I've spent a lot of time over the last 10 years learning just about business principles in general, about economics and about business, and trying to understand uh, how to structure, you know, an, an effective surveying organization. So, um, and I, I hope at the end of the talk, I'd like to share, just, I'll just share some resources with you that have taught me a lot, some, some resources on business. And I tell people a lot, if you've heard me talk before, uh, civil, most civil engineers are pretty bad business people, and uh, land surveyors are even worse business people than civil engineers. So, um, you, know, you can be a great surveyor and be a horrible business person. Um, you know, I, I, another expression I've heard, this isn't mine, but, uh, um, but I'll borrow it is, you know, you, you hate working for your boss, so you start your own business and then you become a boss that everybody hates working for, right? Same kind of, same kind of concept. So business is really important. And, uh, part of what we're going to talk about, a lot of what we're going to talk about today is just the business of surveying and how technology is changing that. So I look forward to covering those topics with you guys. And um, again, this isn't this isn't my talk, it's Mike's talk. Um, but I'm gonna do the best I can to cover to cover the information he had in, in his description for the talk. So uh, you guys can get at least a little bit of what you paid for, hopefully. So what I wanna go over today, we're gonna start with just a, a basic description of some of the technologies that are driving change in land surveying. Again, with a focus on the business side of things, and uh, so we'll go we'll go through those. I've got four or five technologies to talk about. All of these are things I've seen arrive in my career, right? So, 20-year career. These all, everything I'm going to talk about basically didn't exist when I started when I graduated college about 20 years ago. So that's that's an interesting interesting for me, and it, it, I'll enjoy being able to share that perspective with with some of the younger surveyors that are watching the talk. So we'll go through some of that technology that's come up, come about the last 20 years with a specific emphasis on how it's changed the business of land surveying. And uh, we'll talk about some of the consequences of that technology for business. And then uh, and I'm going to talk about four specific consequences I think that all those technologies have in common. So we'll talk about some business consequences of each specific technology and then we'll talk about in general when you take them together. I think there's three or four things bigger kind of consequences, bigger patterns that we want to look at. Uh, then I'll talk about um, some five five trends that I think we already see in motion that I think are going to continue. So, you know, I get my crystal ball out a little bit and I'll try and make some predictions for the future. Um, those of you know, that know me know I've been doing that for a while and, and I'm not very good at it, but you can indulge me and we'll, we'll take a few minutes and talk about where I think some of the trends might be going. And then, uh, then the, at the the last part of the talk, I want to go over you know two or three, maybe four business models that I think you might be looking at if you're a land surveyor uh, moving into the future as as this these trends continue. Um, I'll talk about some business models that I don't think are going to be effective anymore because uh, I, I do think some some business models are are going to go extinct in the near future. But we'll talk about some that might be effective and give you something to think about. And then uh, finally, if we have time, I'll, I'll talk about what I think we might do as a profession, you know, as, as CLSA, other professional organizations like NSPS, what might we do to address some of the challenges that 
land surveyors as business people are facing because of, of changes in technology. So that's what I hope to cover today. What technology has really driven change in the land surveying profession over the last 20 years? As I mentioned in the introduction, you know, I'm, not, I'm getting old, but I'm not. I'm not super old, you know, I don't walk with a cane yet. <laughs> so I've been surveying, I'm a, I'm a little over 40. I've been surveying for about 20 years, about half of that. And uh, that 20 years has really seen a, a, a tremendous change in the land surveying profession and, and the tools that we have at our disposal. Um, and we're gonna, we'll see that also the, the tools that have allowed other non-surveyors to encroach on some of our traditional bundle of services. Uh, but it, it's really been, it's a, it's amazing. Uh, you know, land surveying has probably changed more in the last 20 years than it has in the last 200 years. So some really fundamental shifts in how we do what we do. And I, even in the last 10 years, uh, so starting with the Great Recession about 08, 09, we started to see some changes. And so it's important for the rest of the, the talk today that you, that we just briefly cover what some of those changes are, you know, how, how technology has, has changed in the last 20 years. And we're going to talk specifically about how each of those uh, new technologies, when they came about, changed just the business of land surveying. So we'll talk about kind of at a mechanical level how, how the business changed with each of those uh, uh, technologies as each of those were introduced. So here's the, here's the technologies that I want to cover today. I want to cover uh, what I call push button GPS. Okay, so GNSS is the broader term, but so I want to talk about that. We'll talk about the different kinds. I'll talk about reflectorless EDMs and robotic total stations. Then we'll talk about LIDAR, terrestrial laser scanning, UAVs, and finally GIS. And uh, we'll talk about some of the, the changes, the consequences, business consequences of each of those technologies. And then at the end, I've got the end of that conversation. I have four bigger consequences that kind of apply to the group of technologies as a bundle. So... All right, so let's roll through these real quick. So as I mentioned, the, the first big change that came to surveying in the last 20 years was just the ability to do GPS surveying. And I call it push button GPS because, um, you know, it, it takes considerably less skill to run a GPS uh, receiver, survey grade GPS receiver than it does, say, a, a total station. Um, so, you know, it's basically push the button, turn it on, turn it off kind of deal. So I call it push button GPS. Um, and there's, you know, I've got four different types. So I've got that, you know, first we had static, kind of static, fast static. Then we had uh, PPK, post-process kinematic. Then we had RTK, where you had a base station and a rover, but it was real-time. Then we have real-time network, where you no longer needed a base station. And in the future, we might have what they call PPP, precise point positioning, which means you only need one receiver instead of two. We'll see where that goes. Um, so each of those uh, uh, technologies has come about in the last 20 years. Static GPS surveying was just kind of starting to be a thing when I was going to college. So uh, my last year of college, we did, uh, we had a project where we did a static GPS survey, and um, it was a it was a tough class because even the even my professor didn't really understand how all that worked, and didn't know how to run the software. And you know we we had to check the ephemeris, and we were out in the, you know at, at ten o'clock at night to make sure that we had enough satellites in the sky. So it's really changed a lot since since it first came about. So let's talk. Let's take a minute and just go through some of the business consequences of, of, the, of that technology. So, just GPS in general, and, and fast static and static specifically. What it did, what it meant is we no longer needed line of sight, uh, which was really, really pretty powerful. So up until that point, basically most most kinds of surveying you needed a line of sight, right? So you needed you needed a direct visual line between your your uh, you know whatever you want to call it, control point A and control point B. So you need a direct line of sight. So GPS eliminated the need for that, uh, which was really powerful, especially in mountainous or heavily forested terrain. Uh, the other thing that GPS did is it allowed us to achieve high accuracies over large areas. So now you could survey a mile, 10 miles, 20 miles, 30 miles, 100 miles even. Uh, and if you had the right gear and used follow the right procedures, you could get, you know, you could get really, really good accuracies, uh, and you just you couldn't get close to anything like that over those distances with the total station. So we 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 began to get much more accurate, especially in the, early on, especially in the horizontal component uh, with GPS. Um, so much so that now GPS is the, the primary 
tool that's used for horizontal control surveys. So we no longer need a line of sight. It allowed us to survey over much larger areas. Um, I think it, it really revolutionized the practice of what we call geodesy or the study of the shape of the earth. Then we had RTK came along next. So that was the idea that you could set up a base station over a known point and then have what they call a rover. And you'd get the same type of accuracy you would with static or, or, or close, not quite, but close, uh, but you'd have it in real time. And so that was really important. So now no, no longer do you need line of sight, but now you have real-time positioning. What does that allow you to do at the rover? Now you can do construction layout. You can do staking. You can do search, you know, boundary search. You can do topo, dirt, you know, dirt topo. It's not, wasn't really good enough for hardscape topo. I don't think it is, still isn't. But, um, you know, essentially that real-time positioning was really important because it, it opened up other types of traditional surveying that you had to, used to have to do with the total station, now you could do with GPS that you couldn't do with static, fast static. So, you know, in the early days, static, fast static was primarily used for control surveys, maybe for boundary surveys over, over large areas. But now with the advent of RTK, you can do all kinds of other surveying with GPS. So that was, that was really important. Um, you know, I would say RTK GPS was, was kind of the first tool that really enabled the use of one-man field crews, which we'll talk about some more. Um, so that was really important. Then we then we had um, RTN, real-time network, which basically let you cut the tether to the base. So typically you had to be within a few miles of your base station RTK. Now with RTN, that correction is, is beamed over a cellular connection. So you still have a base, but it doesn't have to be, you don't have to be close to it. Um, and, you, and you can actually have a network of base stations. Um, and so that's pretty typical now in the urban areas in the United States. Saves you the hassle of setting up a base, which if you remember the old days, finding a secure location for your base was a, was a, a headache oftentimes. Um, and you also had issues with radio traffic because RTK beamed the signal over radio. So RTN eliminated those problems and uh, just made RTK that much more efficient. Uh, then uh, the next thing that I think that came about or about the same time is we got what we call robotic one, uh, robotic total stations. So you no longer had to have a man at the instrument. So typical total station surveying, you have a man at the instrument and a man at the rod. Now you eliminate the man at the instrument and you can either have two men at the rod or you just have one man at the rod. So again, robotic total stations, another tool that enabled one man field crews. Right about that same era, maybe a little bit before that, we got what we call reflectorless EDMs. So before that, you had to have a, a, a glass prism to measure distances with the total station. Once we got reflectable CDM, we were able to measure to, to, you know, hard reflective surfaces. Certainly, you could measure without a prism. So that improved the accuracy of things like building shots and uh, also, again, enabled more one-man operation. Uh, I would say after that, we have the advent of, of LiDAR slash terrestrial laser scanning, which is kind of like the reflectable CDM on steroids, right? So now... In, and instead of having to manually point the instrument at each position where you wanted a, a distance return from your reflector's total station, you know, the scanner basically did pretty close to 360 degree scan using a reflector CDM of its surroundings. Uh, very powerful technology, super, super changed things a lot. Um, it's, it's been a technology that I've, I've really enjoyed. I would say, you know, the, 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 the previous three or four technologies, so fast static GPS, RTK, RTN, and robotic total station really didn't change what you could do with the surveying tools. It just, they made the surveying more productive. I think with terrestrial laser scanning, one of the first things we saw is the entry of the non-surveyor, right? So here's a survey grade tool, what I would call survey grade tool, that starts to be used by non-survey practitioners. I guess that's not true. That really started to happen with RTK GPS as well. So on the construction side, the advent of RTK GPS, you start to have non-surveyors non like grade setters um, that, that start to use that technology. Um, and that's a pattern you'll see, you know, as these new technologies arrive, essentially what they do is not only do they make surveying more productive, but they also put survey grade accuracy in the hands of non-professionals with some caveats. Um, so after uh, LiDAR terrestrial laser scanning, we have the UAV. Um, that's just been maybe in the last 10 years. Um, I was an early adopter of that. The technology has certainly gotten much better. Um, and what, what UAVs did is they really democratized photogrammetry. So, you know, it used to be if you wanted aerial mapping, you'd have to call up somebody that owned a $2 million plane with a $1 million camera on it. You'd wait two months, 
and um, you'd get, you know, you could get your aerial topographic mapping. That's no longer the case. Um, I can't remember the last time I hired a photogrammetrist. Um, that I think it still makes sense on large scale projects, but anything under a couple hundred acres now, my team will fly with a with a UAV. We get a, a good product. Oftentimes, it's a it's a better product than you get with a with a traditional aircraft, and the turnaround time is one or two or three days instead of two months. And um, with a lot of other applications there for for inspection and asset management that that UAVs UAVs enable. But again, a a, a really incredible tool. Um, so much so that I think uh, UAVs will have started to and will even more in the future supplant uh, RTK GPS as a, as a means of softscape topo. I think we're going to see that. And then finally, the last one on my list is GIS, and that, that's kind of been growing, you know, all, while all these other surveyor technologies have been advancing and emerging and advancing, GIS has been constantly getting better. It's pretty common household, <laughs> household, not household, but you know, almost everybody in the profession knows what it is. That wasn't true 20 years ago. I spent a lot of time 20 years ago explaining what GIS was and trying to convince surveyors that they could use it. I really don't have to have those battles anymore, um, which is nice. Um, so, and again, GIS is another one of those tools that has really allowed the entry of, um, you know, the non-surveyor kind of into our, our surveyor world. And I would say, especially with GIS on the, on the boundary side of things, real estate and boundary side of things, GIS has really caused some encroachment. Um, some of that good, some of that bad. Um, so th those are all technologies that have come about really, really advanced and matured in the last 20 years. And they all have consequences for business. Um, you know, they've made us more efficient. They've allowed us to collect a lot more data um, in a lot less time. They've enabled one man field crews. So when you think about all those technologies together, the bundle of them, you know, and you think about what are the larger business consequences for land surveying, um, I think you see some patterns emerge. So these are, these are kind of the four bigger consequences of this accumulation of technology that, I, that I've noticed. Okay, and so the first one is what I call the facade of convenience. So if you know what a facade is, if you don't know what a facade is, a facade is a, a fake part of a, of a building that they put on the front of the building to make the building look taller than it really is. So they used to do it in the old west. <laughs> so it's it's a fake front. And so when I talk about the facade of convenience, what I really mean is this technology makes it seem like the acquisition of spatial data is easier, but that's really a facade, right? It's not, it's fake. So what what's happened is, is we've added all these technologies, you know, it's it's kind of black box stupid, right? It's kind of push button stupid on the front end. But on the back end, it, it can be really dangerous. And, it, and, and you know, as you even just having to, if you take it at the simplest thing the last 20 years, just having to integrate GPS into your total station workflows and what that's meant about what the average surveyor has to know about the geoid and gravity and orthometric heights and map projections and, and grid versus ground. Um, you know, I think what that demonstrates is as each of these technologies enters the, the marketplace, it enables new capabilities seemingly reduces the complexity, but really increases the complexity um, of, you know, of integrating these technologies together and using them properly. You know, and I would argue you got to know a lot more today as a licensed land surveyor than you used to. We'll talk about that again in a minute. But so it, it's created what I call this facade of convenience. You know, everything seems push button easy, but if you don't really know what you're doing, you can get burned and there's a lot of edge cases that, that can come up. You know, systems grow more complex there's more opportunity for cascading failures and things like that. Uh, the second consequence is it's really dramatically lowered labor costs. Um, you know, we, we do now, you know, the, we just finished a job of mapping 10 miles a corridor, topographic mapping for 10 miles of a corridor project. We finished in about a week, week of field work, maybe four days of field work, I think. And it's going to be another week or two in the office, but you know that, 20 years ago, that would have taken six months or four months. It was a huge amount of work that we did in just a few days. So it's exponential, exponentially lowered the, the cost of surveying labor. And we talked about it's enabled one man crews. You know what? One of the things that I think Mike wanted to talk about is, you know, that one man crews are a double edged sword. You know, they've allowed us to be a lot more productive, but they've essentially cut off 
for a lot of folks the entry into the profession. Um, you know, it used to be if you had a half a brain and a, and a little bit of muscle, you could get on it, uh, as a rodman or a chainman on a survey crew, and you could kind of work your way up through the ranks. That's how I entered the profession. You know, I started pounding rebar and wood on a on a survey crew, um, and here I am, a licensed surveyor, 20 years later, right? And uh, we, a lot of that, uh, a lot of folks aren't able to in, enter the profession that way anymore, uh, just because we've dramatically reduced the amount of fill work we do. And the fill work that is done is oftentimes done with one-man fill crews. So I would say 80% of the fill work that I did when I started as a surveyor 20 years ago has now been automated. It's no longer needed. And the company that I used to work for, they just they have fewer surveyors, and they don't do that work anymore. I mean, they do that work, but they do it with different tools. It's not with a, with a two-man fill crew or three. I even worked on a couple three-man fill crews when I started. Now, there's companies like mine that will only run one. Two-man field crews because we believe that training opportunity is important, but I think we're the exception. As a general rule, most companies run run one-man field crews. That's where the, com the competitive pressure in the marketplace is. Uh, the third consequence is uh, we've really seen the rise of what I call garbage data. So, and this is a consequence of the facade of convenience, right? Uh, as this technology becomes push button and people don't really understand how it works or what they're doing. And even at a conceptual level, um, you just you have way more opportunities to produce garbage data, right? So it's data that looks good, you know, it's shown to the eight digit past the decimal, whatever, um, but it's it's not good, right? It's trash, um, and I run into that problem a lot. Um, and GIS is a, you know, I think the biggest culprit of this is GIS. Um, there's a lot of garbage data in the GIS systems of the world, and people use that data to make decisions sometimes. Uh, but you see it also, you see it too with GPS, or even with scanning. You know, you, you get you get folks that can go and scan a building, uh, but they can't, sketch, they can't stitch together the scans of two buildings that are across the street or across the campus, right? Um, so if you're, you're, and I've been called by people that have, you know, paid for scanning. They pay to get scans of building A, and then they pay to get scans of building B, but then they can't get... They can't get the scans from building A and building B to fit together, right? Just one example. So a lot of garbage data. I think that garbage data presents a danger to the public. I think we've seen that in California in the last 20 years. You know, we have gas line explosions that kill tens of people, uh, you know, or hundreds of people because uh, there's crappy data about infrastructure and somebody's utility GIS. That's one example. You know, we see people ma ma being mapped into a floodplain when they really shouldn't be into the in the floodplain, things like that. And then finally, the, the fourth thing, and I touched on this a couple minutes ago, is uh, I really think and I really believe it's gotten more difficult to become licensed in the last 20 years. Um, I think that you know the breadth of knowledge that they test on the exam now is is pretty crazy. Um, there's a huge amount you have to know to be a surveyor, and you can't be good at everything. I, I you know I I didn't like hearing that when I was a young surveyor. I thought I could be good at everything, but I realize now that that those older folks were right. You just can't, there's too much to know. Um, it's just, you know, I, I liken it to the medical profession. You know, you can be a good general practice family, a, you know, good general practice doctor, good family doctor, and we need that, but you certainly can't specialize in everything. And, uh, and surveillance, I think, move in that direction. I think more of us and more of us are gonna be forced to specialize in just a couple things or three or four things. Um, we're not gonna be good at everything. You know, I tell people, I don't build skyscrapers or stadiums. That's not my thing. Uh, you know, I used to do hydrographic surveying, but I haven't done it in a long time, and, and I think it's changed. The technology's changed a lot. Um, so, you know, I, I, you probably wouldn't hire me to, to survey a coastline. Um, so there's just things that I don't do. You know, there's things that I've specialized in. So I think it's getting harder to get licensed. I think it's part of the reason why we see fewer people passing the licensing exams. Um, I, there, and that there's more than one thing going on there, but I think that's part of it. And uh, again... You know, even people that, that get a chance to get into the profession and and sit for the exam, they don't get the field experience that they used to get. It's just hard to do that. And I go, I know guys that have had to wait to take the test because they didn't have the required uh, field experience. I think we require a year or two in California. I can't remember the the exact amount, but so those are issues. So those are those are some of the things that technology has done to us as a profession over the last 20 years. As I said, a lot of those things are good. A lot of them are bad. Um, but you can't change it. <laughs> you know, technology is going to keep marching forward, I think. 
Um, and, and you know, sometimes I, I think surveyors want to try and stop that, where they want to use protectionism or legal frameworks to prevent prevent that technology from advancing. And I think that's a losing battle. I think the market forces of the market are against us there. I've got five predictions for the future of land surveying that I want to share with you again with a focus on what the consequences are for the business of, of surveying. And, uh, you know, these are tr most of these are trends that I think are already started and I think they're going to continue into the, into the future. So I want to share these with you. I think they're important. Um, so here's my number one, number one trend. Uh, I think construction staking is going to disappear. Um, now some of you that have known me for a while will know that I was saying that 15 years ago. I thought in five years, 15 years ago, I thought in five years, construction staking would be gone <laughs> and it's not, it's still here. Um, so I think I, I think I got the timing right, but um, I, I think I got the timing wrong, but the trend right. Um, and one of the things I've learned is that uh, new technologies tend to take longer than you think to have an impact, but typically have a larger impact than you predict. So um, I do think construction staking is going to go away. Um, I think in many, many places the rough grade staking is already gone. Um, that's almost all done with machine control now. And I think we're starting to see uh, the finish grade uh, go away. I um, mean, you know, I think the last, so the, what, you know, what surveyors, the last thing surveyors will keep, I think, is probably the, the, the structural staking. Um, but even then, I, I think that's going to go away. Um, it might get sucked into the, <laughs> to the BIM world, I don't know. Um, but this is a real problem. This, this trend is probably the most troubling. Um, it, not for me personally, because I don't do a lot of that work, but I would say 50 to 75% of the surveyors I know are primarily construction stakers. Um, maybe they do a little bit of topo, maybe they do a little bit of boundary, but you know, their, their bread and butter is, is in construction work. And I think that work's going away. I don't think it's going to be around for much longer. Um, and I don't know if it's, if it's five years or 10 years or 15, but I think it's going to be gone before my career ends. My career as a land surveyor ends. And so that's going to have some huge implications for us as a profession. Um, and we, we can talk about what I think some of those, some of those consequences will be in a little bit. But um, I think if, if construction staking is your business model, that's primarily how you make money, I think you should be very afraid. Um, and you need to be thinking about how you're going to make a transition. Uh, this is something I didn't understand when I w was making my predictions about the demise of construction staking, but I think I understand now. I think 90% uh, of topographic surveying is going to go the same way. Um, I think we're going we're gonna to see it get automated. Uh, you know, it's already started to happen with UAVs and, and uh, terrestrial laser scanning, and now we've got U uh, UAV LiDAR. Um, I think all those technologies are going to really eat away at the topo mapping market. Um, I think we haven't seen it yet, but there's a huge potential for some really smart folks to automate a lot of the feature feature extraction process once that data is collected in in the office. I think there'll always be some human involvement there, but I think it could be 80% less than what it is right now. You know, even in my office, if, if we do things properly, you know, we can we can automate 75% of a topo. Um, you know, we're only going in there to finish the, the last 25%. We don't do a ton of topo. I do more topo than I do staking, but, um, you know, one of the things I'm cognizant of as a business owner is that uh, some of that work is going to go away probably um, and I you know we'll we'll still do it um, but you know another common theme I think you're going to find is uh, you know when I'm doing topo surveying it's going to be when those other methods aren't aren't applicable so I'm going to be in an urban canyon or under tree canopy or there's just going to be something really funky going on um, so I'm going to get paid to do it when it when it kind of sucks right if it's easy they'll be doing it with a different tool so that's another trend I think that's going to continue um, this is a trend that, that has has been going for 20 years or more, and I think will continue. The third trend is data acquisition is going to get cheaper and cheaper. Spatial data acquisition is going to get cheaper and cheaper. Uh, but quality control and data management are become more and more important. And so I'll use a, as an example that job I mentioned before. We, we mapped 10 miles of a route corridor, a corridor did, a, did a route survey, topographic survey, and I actually didn't do that work we actually hired a company to help us do that work for the client. And they had the right tool, so they had some, some UAV LiDAR. And, but the client hired us to manage that work. So they said, we want to hire you to make sure that we're using the right tool, 
that we get the results that, that we're supposed to get and you're going to check that data and you're going to ground truth it and you're going to certify it and stamp and seal that it's good data. And uh, so that's what we got hired to do. Uh, it's one of the first times I've been hired to do that. I know there's other surveyors that, that have done it a lot. I think I'm going to do it more in the future. So that's just an example of, you know, the data acquisition has become cheap. But that increases the need for, for the quality control and the, and the management. So that's a trend that, that, that we need to watch. You know, and I'll just point out when we, when we price this work for the client, including our management fee, uh, they were shocked at how inexpensive it was compared to what they thought. And, you know, another thing I think surveyors forget is, you know, nobody likes it when the price of, of surveying drops. Yeah, well, I shouldn't say that. Surveyors don't like it when the price of surveying drops. But, but that there's a, you know, people forget the other side of that economic equation, which is as price goes down, demand goes up, right? So as surveyors become, as surveys become less expensive, spatial data acquisition becomes cheaper. We're going to do more of it, right? There's things that don't get mapped now that should get mapped because it's too expensive. But as the price drops, you know, we're going to be doing a lot more mapping, I think. And so that, that is going to increase the demand for the quality control and the, and the spatial data management. And that's a good thing, I think, for the world, for, for humankind, for the economy. You know, we're going we're gonna to map more stuff because it's affordable to do so. And so that's a positive thing. And if you can get on the right side of that trend, you're, you're going to do well, I think. Uh, so here's my trend number four. Uh, there will be fewer land surveyors. I don't think there's anything we can do to prevent that. You know, the days of the two-man crew or the three-man field crew are probably over. Um... We're just not going to put as many people in the field as we used to. And uh, they're just going to be less of us. You know, construction surveying is going to get automated. And, you know, that could take out, I don't know, 50% of the profession. It's sad in some ways. You know, I, I feel bad that I, I maybe joined a profession that to some extent is dying a little bit. But, um, you know, smart surveyors are going to adapt. And... So I think they're going to be fewer land surveyors, but the flip side of that is they're going to, we're all going to be paid more. <laughs> so, and I think that's a beautiful thing. Um, so as it's kind of ironic as the price of surveys gets cheaper, you know, the price of a land surveyor is actually going to go up. And I think we're already seeing that. We're already starting to see that. Some of that's demographics, I think. Uh, but some of it's, you know, it's what we talked about before. It's harder to get licensed than it used to be. And then uh, some of it is, I just think that, you know, uh, smart surveyors that can manage different kinds of technology and um, are good business people and know how to provide value uh, those those folks guys and gals are going to be in real demand and you know if you're if you're the kind of surveyor that only knows how to pound wood on a construction site you're in trouble uh, but you know if, if you're motivated and, and you're willing to learn and especially if you can write a little code and do things on the computer um, you know i think you've got a bright future in land surveying um, i also think uh, this is part of Trend number four, I think surveyors are going to specialize more. You know, I love all kinds of different survey and I love doing different stuff, but I found even in my own career, I've, I've been forced just by market pressure to specialize. Um, and so I'm, I'm doing that now. You know, I mostly work in commercial real estate uh, and land development. So I don't do a lot of public work surveying anymore, uh, which I used to and I really enjoyed it, but I just don't do it as much. Um, and even in that, within that realm, I've started to specialize so you know, we, we do a lot of ag work where we're at in the Central California, Central Valley. And uh, we do a lot of industrial uh, because that's the area that we're in. You know, we have a lot of logistics here in the Central Valley. So we're starting to specialize in that type of real estate specifically. And, you know, even inside of my own shop, you know, I, I don't really do the UAV mapping anymore. I'm, I'm a certified UAV pilot, but it's hard for me to keep up on all that stuff. I don't, I don't get as much time to fly as I used to. So my partner now is the primary UAV guy. You know, he keeps up on all the latest gizmos and stuff. So even within my organization, which is very focused, I think uh, we're starting to see surveyors specialize. And, you know, I think you're going to find that these organizations that try, the surveying organizations that try to be everything to everybody are going to struggle. Um, I think you're going to see the organizations that really do well are the ones that pick two or three market niches and really, really focus on being great at those things. I think it'll be interesting to see how that trend plays out. Um, I wonder if at some point we're going to need to segment the surveying license. Um, I know there's been some discussion of that. I've always 
not been a very big fan of that idea, but I'm starting to come around. You know, I, I think I, as I see people struggle to master the huge body of knowledge that you need to pass that test, um, I wonder if it, if it might make sense to, to specialize a little bit, you know, to break that into pieces. So I'm open to that debate. I think I think I could be convinced. I'm not convinced yet, but I could be convinced that, that that's a good idea. And that's part of that trend towards specialization, I mean. And finally, the fifth, the fifth trend or prediction, I think, is that uh, organizations with a good reputation and a robust training program are going are gonna to prosper while other organizations wither. So let me explain that a little bit. We talked about how one-man crews have really tra changed the entry into the profession. It's, it's more difficult now than it used to be. I think organizations that really focus on building a good apprenticeship program um, are going are gonna to do really well. Um, to some extent, I think the university system in the United States has failed us. Um, I don't think it delivers what I need as an employer most of the time, and I think it's way overpriced. Uh, we may see COVID-19 change some of that. It may become more accessible, more affordable, but I really, I really find that it's failed me as an employer, and I think there's a lot of other employers that feel that way. I'm not saying the four-year surveying degree is going away, but I think uh, companies that recognize that that they can accomplish a lot with a good good apprenticeship program and put that into place are going to do well. Um, I also uh, I talked about uh, you know having a good reputation. I think is going to be more important. You know, as data collection becomes more of a commodity, um, I think I think your reputation is going to become more important. You know, it, right now. To some extent, you know, if you if you know how to get the data, you 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 can get a you can get the work. But I think that's going to change. I think uh, the profit margins on that data acquisition are going to get squeezed uh, really really tight. And um, I think you know you need to move up what I you need to move up what I call the the value stack, right? And we'll talk some more about that in a minute. But um, I think your reputation, if if you think about it, if you're doing the quality control, quality assurance, or the or the management tasks. Uh, people, people are going to care about your reputation, right? So I think companies are going to have to start to work really hard to keep a good reputation, and that's something that I know I try hard, really hard to do in my business. So there you go. There's the five trends. Uh, it's kind of depressing, but I don't, I don't think it's something we can stop. I think it's unavoidable. So I think if you're, you know, if you're a construction surveyor, uh, you're in trouble. Uh, if you're mostly a topo surveyor, you might be in trouble. And um, you know, I think you need to. You need to learn something about GIS. You need to learn something about, um, you know, uh, how to work efficiently with data on a computer, which probably involves some kind of coding. Um, and, and surveyors need to know that stuff. So if you believed half of what I've, I've talked about so far, um, now you're, you're probably depressed, but it's not all bad news. So you may be wondering, all right, Landon, I, I think you've got me convinced. I agree with you at some point in the future. You know, we're not going to be doing a lot of surveying on the construction site, no, not a lot of staking at least. And, and uh, you know, we might not be doing as much topo as we used to. What do I do? You know, I've got 30 years left of my career. I've got 20 years left of my career or 10 years left of my career. What do I do to prepare for the future? So I want to talk about uh, four, four possible business models that might work. And it's, and it's, I shouldn't call them business models. They're not that fleshed out, but I'll, I'll give you the concepts at least. And uh, something to think about, and I'd love to talk more about it. Um, you know, if you, if you have questions or you want to talk more, please reach out to me. I think these are conversations we need to have, and I don't have all the answers for sure. So I talked, I talked before about moving up the value stack. You know, if you think, you think of the, the process that we use to add, give that, provide value to our clients kind of as a stack or a chain. You know, at the bottom of that chain is the actual data acquisition, right? And then you've got kind of data analysis, and then you've got like, okay, decision making. What do you do with the date with the data? And then at the top, you know, strategy, right? What questions do you need to be asking? <laughs> that kind of thing. You know, as you move up that stack, you get you provide more and more value to the client. So I keep telling surveyors, I, I shouldn't say that. I've told surveyors more than once, you need to get off the bottom rung of that stack, right? If you're in the data acquisition stack. You're in trouble. You need to get to the next couple of levels up in the stack, right? The data analysis, providing answers, right? Even the strategy part. So let me talk about these these four uh, business models. I think uh, so. Here's my first one: spatial data management. That's just the job where you are helping somebody else manage their spatial data, right? Whether it be acquisition or analysis, 
any of that. Okay, so it's uh, why do we need the data? How do we get the data? You know, when do we get the data? What do we do with the data after we have it? You know, how do we organize and index and catalog the data? Who gets access to it? How do we extract the right information from it? How do we ensure that the work products we're getting from the data are the right work products, that they're quality work products? All of those things. Spatial data, spatial data management, I think it's going to be really important for, especially for large organizations moving forward. They're going to need help with that. We are going to, we, we are just going to be generating a ton of, of spatial data every year. It's just, it's going to, it's going to be mind blowing. And, um, and I'm already starting to see that. So how do we help organizations manage all that data and, and get value from it? I think that's a great business model. I think you got to know a little bit about GIS to do that. Um, you know, I, um, you might have to know a little, little bit about programming to do that. Not necessarily, but it would help. So, um, so that's, that's a potential data model or a business model, excuse me. Uh, my number two is just data quality, uh, which is a little bit, it's part of number one, but I think it's, a, you could, you could do, you could build a business just on that business model, right? So data quality, testing, assessment, certification. I think we might see surveyors head that way in the construction realm. So instead of doing um, staking, I think we, we might see surveyors doing certified as builds, you know, uh, you know, certified uh, record drawings. You know, we, we do that already a little bit with like pad certs and form certs. I think we might see some more of that. Maybe maybe it's certified monitoring. You know, maybe you're out monitoring control or monitoring structures as construction progresses. So not quite an inspection role, but like a quasi-inspection role, right? Where you're out there making sure that the contractor's doing his surveying correctly or her surveying correctly. So I think that's just there's just a data quality um, business model there that could be, a, you know, same thing with LIDAR, right? Just making sure somebody's LIDAR data is good. Right, um, and just and managing that process for clients. Um, the third, the third business model is to really specialize. Um, that's not really a business model. I guess that's just some advice. You know, you, you pick one or two things and you do really good at that. I told you at my shop we, we're we're focused on commercial real estate, and even within commercial real estate, a couple key kinds of commercial real estate that allows us to see patterns and trends that we wouldn't otherwise see. And then the, finally, the, the last thing is, um, you know, I think it's going to be important for surveyors to get some knowledge of some adjacent related activities that are not necessarily survey. So GIS is an example of one of those, right? Not traditionally a survey activity, but I think if you know GIS and you know that tool and you know what it can be used for, I think it really opens up some, some great business opportunities for you. And one of the things I've started to do is just learn more about real estate in general, right? So how the process of buying and selling real estate works, the land use planning, how zoning and land use planning and land development regulation work, even how property is taxed and the rules that govern how property is taxed. And I'm just, I'm naturally being pulled in that direction just because of the kind of business we do. But I find that as my knowledge of those related areas grows, uh, my value as a surveyor increases, right? It gives me the opportunity to offer some unique solutions to my clients. And I find also in my practice now that, that I've really started working much more closely with related professionals, appraisers, attorneys, brokers, land title folks, right? And uh, my ability to, to build those kind of teams and use them to solve problems the clients has, you know, that really, that makes us valuable. So I think other surveyors need to do that as well. You know, you, you need to learn about some things besides just surveying. You know, look at those adjacent professions or industries and find out, you know, how you can help them, how they can help your client. Um, so I guess those last two aren't really business models. They're, they're more just recommendations. But I'd love to hear, you know, I'd love to hear more. Uh, I'd love to hear your guys' ideas on, on what biz the business model of the future might be for your, for your land surveyor. I do think the land surveyor of the future looks very different from the land surveyor of 20 years ago. I know that. And maybe even very different from the land surveyor of today. Could look very different from that as well. I wanted to end the, the talk with a couple things. One is, uh, what are some things we might do as a profession, you know, through our professional organizations like CLSA, uh, to help surveyors adapt, especially surveying business people, adapt with, with the, the challenges that these technologies are bringing. And then I just wanted to share some I got a stack of business resources I just want to share with you guys if you want to learn more about uh, 
business. I think he's in his room. So, what might we do as a profession? Uh, I think it's really important that we work to build apprenticeship programs. Um, I really like the CST program. It's an excellent program from NSPS. I, I want to get involved in that. I want to do some more with it if I can. You know, one of the things that that's that's one of the shortcomings of the CST, I guess, is um, it doesn't provide much on the training side. So it's mostly testing and certification. I think it'd be great to get 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 some of the training side of that implemented. But it's a really great program. It's something I use in my own business. I think we need more things like the CST. Um, I think we need to start reaching out to people that may not be a great fit for a four-year university degree. I think we're not getting our value out of that as employers anyways. Um, so, you know, working through our professional organizations on robust training programs I think is important. You know, I, I think we're doing this to some extent, but I think we need to work harder to help folks get past that licensing exam. Uh, like I said, I think it's it's gotten a lot tougher. You have to know a lot more than you used to. Um, I think we should have some conversations at least about uh, breaking the license up into specialties potentially. I know that's controversial. I'm, I'm, I haven't been a big fan of that, as I mentioned, but I think it's something that we need to talk about. I think it would make licensing more achievable. It would probably more accurately reflect reality. You know, maybe we have a, a scaled down version of the overall test uh, that you have to pass just with the basics, measurement basics. Um, and then we allow people to specialize in in boundary surveying or land use planning or topographic mapping or construction surveying. I don't know. I'm open to I'm open to that idea. I think it's something that it's a conversation we should be having as a professional association. So I think thinking about how we help people pass the license, considering how specialization might impact that, you know, helping employers implement robust apprenticeship programs or maybe even implementing the apprenticeship programs themselves as a as an agency, I think Provide good opportunities for continuing education is going to be important. You know, this the world's only getting more complicated. You know, helping surveyors learn to use and properly use and adapt to these new technologies, I think is important. I apologize for the, my house is crazy and I got dogs barking in the background. I'm sorry. Um, so, you know, those are two or three things that, that I think we need to do. Um, some people would add to that list, we, that, you know, that we need to protect like, the scope of licensure. I could be convinced of that. I'm a little bit skeptical. I think those market forces are hard to push back against. I do think it's really important that we educate the broader public about when when it's important to have a land surveyor involved because of public health and safety. And I think we have to be careful about not being self-serving in that because we have a conflict of interest there, right? And I think people smell that sometimes, and that's why there's a pushback against licensing in general. But I think if we're honest about when it's really important to have a surveyor involved, um, and, and we can have honest conversations with GIS folks, for example, about that. I think it'll it'll help us make our case. So I think there is some room for for that in the conversation. I think our professional associations should be involved in that. So what are some good business resources? I wanted to share a few with you. Um, the number one thing I want you guys to check out if you're interested in learning more about business is a podcast called Econ Talk. Um, they talk about some non-business stuff on there too, but it's an economics podcast. They cover a lot of business stuff. I have learned more from that podcast than probably any other single source. <laughs> it's really changed how I look at the world, and I think it's made me a better better business person. So check that out. Econ Talk is the podcast. I wanted to share with you um, two magazines that I that I subscribe to and that I really enjoy. One is called MIT Sloan Management Review. So it's good. I think this one's quarterly. It's got some good stuff in it. But I really like Harvard Business Review. This is, uh, I think, every two months this comes out. And it, you know, it's not a cheap subscription. It's a couple hundred bucks a year, but so much good information in here, especially if you're running a little bit larger organization. I mean, there's good stuff in there, even if you're only running a, a, a small shop like mine. But um, you know, as organizations get bigger, they get harder to run. Really, really good stuff in here. If this is a good, 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 good use of your money. And then I wanted to share with you guys three books that have really changed my view of business. Um, this first one is called Blue Ocean Strategy, a really good book about standing standing out from your competition. So I encourage you to read it. There's actually a second volume, so there's a there's a sequel to this that I haven't read yet. It's on my shelf though. So but Blue Ocean Strategy, good book. Uh, this is a phenomenal book. You can see I got it tabbed all over, but it's called The Business of Expertise. Really great book that's focused on consultants. I think uh, it should be required reading for every land surveyor that's going to start his own business. 
The Business of Expertise. They just finished this book a couple weeks ago. Excellent, excellent. One of the best books I've ever read. Might be in my top three books of, of all time. Um, the Checklist Manifesto I really like because it, it, it helps you as a professional deal with some of the complexity we talk about and it talks about specialization in here, which is one of those other trends that, that we talked about in the in the video today. So a uh, good book. Check this out. The Checklist Manifesto. If you work with me, you know I'm a checklist Nazi. This book is part of the reason why. Uh, one other book that I'll mention, maybe two other books I'll mention real quick. I don't I don't have them here with me, but one is uh, called the uh, The Innovation Stack. It's by the, the founder of Square, technology company Square. It's a really good book. Lots of good stories in there, business stories from, from history, and uh, lots of good useful information. So check that out, the innovation stack. And then um, there's another book, but it's actually by so H HBR, Harvard Business Review. They do a magazine, but they also do books. And they've got a book called, uh, I think it's just called The Basics, uh, or The Essentials. It's called The Essentials. Um, there's a really great chapter in that book called What is Strategy that I think should be required reading if you're going to own a business, but that's another great book, HBR, The Essentials. It's on Amazon. You can find it. So uh, hopefully those are some things that will help you. I would like to write some more and, and, and uh, blog some more about business. I just I don't have as much time, but I will, I will try and do that. Um, uh, I'll try and do that on my website, landonblake.com, um, in the future. And, uh, yeah, if you're, if you're a fan of business and also a land surveyor or GIS professional, I'd, I'd love it to, if you just reach out to me and we can talk and, you know, we can just uh, we can brainstorm and throw some ideas off one another. So, hope you guys enjoyed the talk today. I hope I know I I know I struggled to do Mr. Palomar justice, but I hope I was on the right track with some of what he wanted to share with you guys. And uh, I look forward to being able to to answer your questions at the actual at the actual conference.